Good morning. Adam is just back with us. He and Haley had a little baby, and this is his first Sunday leading in quite some time, so thrilled to have them. Adam, it was good to have you today. Come on, yeah, somebody's clapping. Um, if you're new with us, I'm Michael Mattis. I pastor Saltbox Church. If you're joining us online, either actively on YouTube or Facebook um, or even in arrears, I want to say a big welcome to you. Um, we are uh, just excited to be here. We're excited about what God is doing in our time, in this season, in this day, um, in our church, and even in our hearts. We've been looking at the book of John, um, and we're getting to the last few chapters. I'm in John 14. I'm in the last couple chapters of John 14. And, um, I, you know, I think I'm supposed to say something before I even jump in. I'm going for it. Um, let's see. What am I supposed to say? Ukraine. We raised $3,000 to give to Ukraine. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. We partnered with um, a sunflower farm um, in, I think it was Rocky Point or, or Leland, and all that money went right over to Ukraine. Um, so anyway, way to go, guys. Way to be generous. Praise Jesus. Okay, I am in uh, John 14. I'm going to pick up in verse 15, and I'm going to uh, go all the way to the end of verse 31. Um, we're going to do what we always do, which is read the word um, and attempt to understand sort of what Jesus is saying, why he is saying it, and then we're going to do what we always do or attempt to do and pivot into allowing him to then interact with our hearts, our lives, um, our relationships in and through what the word says. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so uh, after we read it, I'll, I'll share some things as we go through it, um, but then I want to open this door, and it's this big kind of challenging door. Um, one author that I like actually calls the third person of the Trinity, now who's that? The Holy Spirit, the forgotten God which I think is interesting, forgotten God. Holy Spirit uh, often um, either is misunderstood or makes us uncomfortable, and that's what the Lord Jesus is introducing here. So we're going to look at the text, then we're going to go simply, okay, based on what Jesus is saying, how do we be filled with the Spirit, uh, number one. We're going to look at then what keeps us from being filled uh, with the Spirit, Spirit, number two. And then number three, we're going to look at what are a couple things that we can do as people to cultivate an ongoing relationship with the Holy Spirit. This is a theological nightmare. Here we go. Are you ready? Okay, let's, let's laugh a second and be, be fun here for just a minute. Right now on social media, there's something going on uh, called the a tortilla challenge. Has anyone seen this? Like four of you, good, great. Oh, there's some more, come on. Okay, so what happens on social media? I'm convinced that this is the way it works, that in a middle school cafeteria, a couple of people get together and they come up with this idea, right? And then a couple of cool kids get a hold of the idea and post it on their, it's not even Instagram anymore, I think it's TikTok now is the thing of choice. Um, but they post it on their TikTok and then slowly it works its way back up the generations and all of a sudden you have older adults engaging in what was happening in the middle school cafeteria. So this is the way this works. Um, you take a, a bottle of water and you take a big a tortilla, like one of those 14 inch, you know, the guys you get at like um, Chipotle, you know, those really big. And apparently you take a big chug of water and then you take turns and you whap each other with the tortilla. <laughs> I mean, I told you, I'm sixth grade middle school, right? Cafeteria, I mean, that's like, so the goal though is you take turns and you've got this mouthful of water and you go, whoop, whoop, and the goal is that you make the other person empty their water. <laughs> Laugh. So it's like this laughing game. And all of a sudden you have adults on all these TikTok uh, and Instagram and probably Facebook, who knows, I don't do much social media, but playing this game. So the point of the game is to make the other person laugh and therefore <laughs> empty themselves. Ready for the pivot? This entire message is actually aimed at you emptying yourself. And here's why. God can't fill what he doesn't own. Let's go a step deeper. God can't fill what he doesn't possess. Okay, at the end of today, I'm going to clean up. We're going to have a few things here at church, and then I'm going to go to my 
home. Do I ever go to somebody else's home? Like, think about that just a second. Silly analogy. Do I ever go show up and live at somebody else's house and kick my shoes off and go pour myself a glass of whatever in the kitchen? Why? It's not mine. God cannot fill what he doesn't own. He cannot fill what he doesn't possess. Again, the goal of this message is to empty so that we as people would come to this place where we actually empty ourselves so that God can. Okay, let's start there. Ready? Uh, John 14, we're picking up in verse 15. Uh, what you need to know as you head into this um, is this is, these are the final moments that Jesus is speaking to his favorite, most beloved people. Okay, these are the final moments. He's heading to a cross. He's hours away at this point. And this is like, um, I, can, I can sort of imagine the Lord Jesus on his knees when the, other, the disciples are not around and sort of going, Lord, what do you want me to tell them in these final moments? What are the things that they're actually gonna remember? What are the things that will impact them most for future generations? What are the things that we need to have read and taught in the church in 2000 years in Wilmington, North Carolina? What are the things that by the spirit of God you want me to impart to these uh, 12, now 11, almost teenagers, 16 to 22 year olds. And that's where we pick this up in verse 15. Jesus says, chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the father, who's the father? God, Yahweh in their minds, and he will give you another advocate. Who, who said comforter? I heard it already. Come on, Barbara. Okay, we're coming back to your comforter because that's really good. You're reading King James or New King James? Something. New International. Okay, good, good, good. All right. Another uh, advocate is what mine says, to help you and be with you forever. Verse 17. The spirit of truth, uh, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Okay, so where does he live? In us. So this is all this Christian theology. It's like super Pauline. It's like Jesus in us. So you have Jesus who's fully human, fully God on planet earth, and God is dwelling where? In Jesus. Jesus is going to go to a cross and die and then be resurrected, break the back of death, hell, and sin. At that point when he rises, we then have the opportunity to allow Jesus to be in us. You get this idea, this mysterious kind of union of God in Jesus, Jesus being fully God now in us. And then we introduce this idea of a spirit of truth. Okay, the world cannot accept him because uh, it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. Here's the theology of sonship and daughtership. I touch on this a lot. It changes everything in your own mind, your own heart, your own experience when you understand you are a son and a daughter of the Most High. I will come to you, verse 19, before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you will also live. I imagine the disciples sitting here at this moment going, what? Say it again. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me, and anyone who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and show myself to them. Okay, then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, Judas Iscariot was the guy that uh, just left to betray him um, in last week's message, or two weeks ago, I think. Uh, he said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home in them. Okay, let's pause for just a minute here. Our home with them or our home in them. Okay, who's our? God the Father. God the Son, Jesus, God the Holy Spirit. We're going to make our home with them. So circle home. If you have a paper Bible and you're not on your phone or you want to, if you want to highlight it, do that too. But circle home. Now, put your finger there or look there at verse 23 and go back to the beginning of chapter 14. This would have been two weeks ago in our preaching. And I want you to look at verse 2. 
My father's house has plenty of room. Circle house. Greek word here um, is monai. Okay, not that that's all that important, but here's why it is important. Jesus is saying, uh, so go back to chapter 14, verse 2. My father's house has plenty of room. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Okay, so Jesus is going where? Heaven to a home to prepare a place for who? Okay, so he's gone to heaven. He's going to heaven. He's saying, I'm getting ready to depart. I'm going to heaven, and I'm going to make a home, an abode, a place for you to abide, a mansion for you to live for all eternity. And then he flips it. Go back to verse 23. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me and obey, uh, will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home. Say home. Okay, this is so important because what you get here is Jesus is saying, listen, everyone, listen, disciples, I'm getting ready to go home. I'm going to go home and I'm going to make a home and an abode, a dwelling place, a mansion for you in eternity in paradise. And now your job while you are still on planet earth, are you alive? If you're breathing, if you're alive, your job is therefore to cultivate hearts in which I can make my home on. You get that? So you get this like thing that Jesus is sort of unfolding immediately. Your job, or Jesus is saying, my job is to go and make your heavenly home. Your job is to cultivate hearts in which I can make my earthly home. You follow me? This is this transition from Old Testament to New Testament. God no longer dwells in a temple. It's why I don't love any time we call the church or the auditorium or the room in which we meet a sanctuary. Because the sanctuary is now where? Us, the temple is now where? So, so you become the abode, you become the dwelling place. So God's like unfolding this thing. Jesus is teaching them and he's saying, hey, I'm going home, I'm gonna prepare a mansion for you. Now you become my earthly mansion. Cultivate a heart that I can live in. So the question's then gonna become, how do we cultivate that? All right, let's keep going. Verse 24, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. I love the oneness. Father God, Father Son, Father Holy Spirit. I mean, it's, it's such beautiful oneness. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate, Barbara, what's yours say? Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Okay, let's pause here a minute because I think to, to go into this, you've got to understand these two kind of foundational principles. Number one, Jesus has gone to make a home and he has called us to make a home for him here on earth right now. You are his home. I wonder how we would live and think and move and act if we truly believe the Almighty lived in me. Okay, so uh, comforter. This is in, my Bible says advocate. Barbara says comforter. Um, Let's dig into that just a little bit. Um, Comforter comes from the Latin word uh, fortis, and I think this is important for one primary reason. Um, The King James, which is really where yours is coming from, Barbara, um, was written in Old England, and it was uh, written by... um, Uh, some Bible translators, and they translated this. It was coming from the Latin Vulgate and the original Greek, and they took this word fortis, and they translated it comforter. Now, uh, in today's language, um, when I think of comfort, I don't know about you, um, but we were out out on the the, um, beach yesterday, and it rained on us, and everybody got wet and cold. Okay, so I have these two little ones. So we get home and everybody's wet and cold, a little bit tearful. So guess what I did? I made some hot chocolate. Okay. And we sat around. So what am I doing? Comforting. So so for me, when I think of comfort, I tend to think of things like hot chocolate. I think of let's snuggle up on a couch with a cover, you know, and eat some popcorn and watch a movie. That, now, I don't know if that's you, but that's what I think. I think of my grandma who knit these huge afghans. You know, it's comforting. It's comfortable. But what the King James, when they first translated this word fortis, which meant comfort, had nothing to do with that. 
Okay, so what it actually meant at this day and age is you're living, you're coming right off of feudal England. Um, it was also true in Palestine in the day when Jesus lived. But you have all these um, bands of marauding raiders. You have people who attack. You have warlords who come in. What do you think makes you comfortable in that setting? Is it a cup of hot chocolate? Is it an Afghan? Here comes Pharaoh and his armies. What makes you comfortable? Being safe. What, what, so fortis actually means fortified. It means brave. It means um, you're protected. So what this word actually means is I'm going to send you the comforter whose primary job is to make you safe, to make you fortified, to hide you behind a wall. And not only that, but it's actually to give you courage and make you brave so that you can face all the difficulties of life. So this isn't like, hey, the Holy Spirit's here so you can snuggle up on the couch under a comforter and eat popcorn and drink hot chocolate and watch a movie. Nothing wrong with that. We do that at our house. But the problem becomes when we minimize the third person of the Trinity to his primary role is to make you feel good. In fact, his primary role is often to take you out of your comfort zone and make you brave to face the armies that are charging your hill. Come on, now life in, life on planet earth, we could go around this room and if we were honest, every one of us would be able to stand up and go, I'm facing financial difficulty, I'm facing uh, health difficulty, we've got a crisis, we just lost someone, someone has been hurt in our family, we've got, we could go on and on, right? So what the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit actually becomes is to shape you, give you heart, give you courage, to comfort you in the journey and to make you brave, there was actually uh, a few years ago, I think I wrote it down, let me see if I can find it, 2013, a lady by the name of Amanda Cook wrote a song, and I'm pretty well convinced she didn't understand the theological framework behind what she was writing, but she wrote this song called You Make Me Brave. It's so good. Like theologically, it's just like dead spot on. You know, sometimes you get songs and they're like, kind of, you know, maybe... But this one, in my opinion, based on who the Holy Spirit is, who Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit is, he is saying this is the comforter, the one who will make you brave, the one who will give you courage, the one who will allow you to face um, all that is in your current world. So let's go back to it. Verse 26, but the advocate, this is Jesus talking, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now, rhetorical question. When does the Holy Spirit come? Let's read it again. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, is he here yet? As Jesus is speaking, is he here yet? No. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, future, he will send in my name. What name? Jesus will teach you all these things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. We need to ask ourselves, and it's gonna come, I'm going to come back at the end of this message. When is it that the comforter or the advocate comes? Park it in the side of your brain. We'll come back. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I actually begin to look at uh, this passage as almost like a last will and testament of King Jesus. It's like, I'm going to give you my presence, the Holy Spirit. I'm, and, and by the way, um, if the Holy Spirit is foreign to you, you may want to begin to think of him as the Spirit of Jesus. Okay? That's, that's like Romans. It's very biblical. The Holy Spirit of where the Holy Spirit is, Jesus is, where Jesus is. Okay, you got it. Peace I leave with you. So, so the, this idea that Jesus is like, this is like his last will and testament. I'm giving you my Holy Spirit. I'm giving you my peace. Um, I'm not going to leave you alone as, as orphans. Um, and then I'm giving you this comforter, this, this, this advocate that's going to make you brave in all the circumstances of your life. It, we ought to just pause there and reflect for just a second. Peace is so rare. I mean, like real peace. Like the number of people who you can almost look into their eyes and go, are you experiencing true peace? Is there peace in your home? Is there peace in your heart? Is there peace in your marriage? Is there peace at your job? Is there peace in, I mean, peace is rare. And he's offering us peace. 
Verse 28, you heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I've told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. What's he talking about there? He's going away. Death, resurrection, and then ascension up into heaven. That's exactly right. And Acts, if you want to fact check that. Verse 30, I will not say much more to you for the prince of this world is coming. I'm not going to deviate here, but I think this is really important. According to Jesus, who is currently ruling the world? The prince of the world, Satan. Yeah. Will he always? No. Jesus will return. That's the end of the book. Different sermon. But I think it's very important because it begins to give context. People are always like, why do bad things happen to good people? Why does God let so much suffering happen? We are in a season, a time where God has sovereignly allowed certain things to happen, to grab people's attention, um, to to even um, get them to uh, surrender their lives to him, um, to walk with him. Uh, Maybe we say it like this. C.S. Lewis actually used to say, uh, God uh, whispers to us in our pleasure and he shouts to us in our God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. So we're in this sovereign period of time. God will come back and set up a new heaven, a new earth. But we're in this time where there is some suffering, there is some pain, and God is still good in it. And he's about using it, not only for your good, but his glory, if you'll trust him and walk with him in it. Problem is sometimes we don't like what he's doing. Fair? Got to surrender it. Okay. Okay. Keep going. Verse 29, um, verse 30. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of the world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come, now let us leave. So you get this idea they're leaving um, the house. All right, Lord Jesus, would you, would you open the word to us? Would you allow us to see and would you allow us to make some applications um, as, we, as we walk through this? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, here we go. Um, I have studied and looked back and forth and gone, okay, Lord Jesus, I, I don't believe in like, um, like rules or like, you know, this is how you do it or, or like the lockstep version of Christianity, but I think there are often guiding principles that Jesus has set forth. So let me give you three guiding principles on how to be filled with the advocate or the comforter. Are you ready? Okay, number one, empty yourself. God can't fill what he doesn't own. God can't fill what he doesn't possess. Um, We'll come back to this idea, empty yourself. Uh, Second thing um, is a desire to be filled. Let's wrestle with that for just a minute. A desire to be filled. I think a lot of Christians, I'm gonna cut a little bit of a line here. Um, I think a lot of Christians want to be saved, but I'm not sure that a lot of us as Christians want to be filled with the Spirit. It's really hard because you're actually surrendering your will to be possessed by another. In the book of Acts, we're not going to go through it, but in the book of Acts, uh, when people come to Christ, uh, there's, there's two scenarios that unfold. Sometimes people come to Christ um, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit immediately. Sometimes people come to Christ and it's not, uh, it's, it's days or weeks or sometimes months later that they're actually filled with the Spirit. So theologically, is the act of being filled with the Spirit um, the same as the act of giving your heart to Jesus? Not quite. Can it happen at the same moment? Yes. Does it always happen at the same moment? No. So I would generally call the act of being filled with the advocate, the comforter, um, a second work. Okay. So let's keep going. Um, Number one, empty yourself. Number two, a desire to be filled. Um, Perhaps just circle this. I think many of us as Christians don't truly have the desire to be filled because of the cost of what we will have to surrender to him. Like it's costly. And we'll open that in just a second. And then the third thing is uh, you've got to ask. Empty yourself, desire to be filled. And thirdly, you've got to ask to be filled. Now, this is like a present active. Ask and keep asking. Desire and keep desiring. Knock and keep on knocking. And the door will be open to you. 
So it's like this, it's this seeking, it's this asking, it's this desiring, um, and it's keep on asking. Okay, pretty simple, first three. Let's pivot a second into what keeps us from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Let me open something up here personally because I think it'll help you. Um, If you looked at me today... And you said, Michael, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Somebody actually said that to me today. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't answer, but here's how I would have answered. I am progressively recognizing how much of myself I am filled with. Just being honest. That's what happens in my marriage. That's what happens with my kids. That's what happens at the business we own. That's what happens at church. And I'm like... Oh my goodness. And what that opens is an opportunity for me to empty so that I can be, remember God can't fill what he doesn't own. So is Michael filled with the spirit? Yes. Yes. But I've yet to wake up in the morning where I don't recognize there's areas where God has called me to surrender and empty myself to a greater degree so that I can be filled. So am I as filled as I could possibly be today? I hope. Am I going to be more filled tomorrow? If I keep walking in obedience in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, yes. So you might sit there and go, okay, Michael, if you've been filled, what happened? Here's what happened. I got up and I decided I'm going to walk in my own self-confidence today. Y'all do that? We spent a lot of time teaching our kids self-confidence. I'm not saying that's all bad, but here's what I'm saying. The moment you choose to be filled with yourself, what are you saying no to? being filled by the person and presence of God. It's like, so in a situation, something happens, your immediate response, I know how to handle this because I'm self-confident. Right? You know that one? I know that one. What about self-dependence? I'm journeying along, or self-independence might be another word. I like to be independent. I don't like to need people. I don't like to need God. I like to do it my way. What? Why is this pastor saying that? Because I'm that way. Left to my own devices. And guess what? You are too. Okay, let's keep going. What about, uh, this is a challenging one. Let me flip this one because I think this is interesting. What about, today I'm going to choose to wallow in my self-pity. I'm choosing to embrace Instead of letting the comforter heal, restore, make me brave, touch my heart, raise me up, lift me, send me, I'm going to choose my own version of his comfort, my own version of uh, taking care of myself and need meeting, and I'm going to wallow in my own self-pity. When you choose that, you're simultaneously saying no to who? God. Oh. What about self-aggrandizement? Pride. What about self-love? I want it my way. I want it my, in my timetable. I want it when I want it. I want it how I want it. What about self-admiration? The moment I embrace in self-admiration, oh, Michael's really something. What happens? Come on, you do it too. I'm being silly and I'm giving you like these vulnerable moments. But the point is that you would actually begin to look at it and go, man, I've never even thought that when I engage in this, filling myself with my own self, I'm simultaneously rejecting God. And through the degree that you begin to actually empty yourself is the degree that he can begin to fill. Okay. How about this one? I think I'm going to hang in my self-security and flip the coin, insecurity today. I'm just an insecure person. Michael! Y'all hear me? 
The moment we choose our path, our self-definition, our, um, we self-define who we are, whether it's confidence or insecurity, we're filling ourselves with what is ours and rejecting what is his. Either y'all are with me or I'm like stepping on your toes. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> we could keep going, self-definition. We could go all the way down. But the, the, the essence of what I'm attempting to communicate to you is you're either going to be full of yourself or you're going to be full of King Jesus or the, the, the spirit of Jesus, who is also known as the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the advocate. You're going to be filled with one or the other, but you're not going to be filled with both. Let me, let me see if I can open up your heart just a second. I had a situation that happened right before the service and I felt my, <clears throat> do y'all know what I'm talking about? Now that for me looks one way, for you it might look another way. For you it might look insecure, hang your head, I'm done. For me it might look <clears throat> different situations and different people look different ways. But I had this moment, there was an interaction, there was a conversation and the me that I don't like, you know what I'm talking about? rose up and I went, great. I'm preaching, I'm being filled with the spirit <laughs> and I have an opportunity to be full of, Michael, I have an opportunity here to get angry, to get disappointed, to hang my head, to be insecure, to go hide behind the curtains or I have an opportunity to actually recognize that that's the path of the enemy for Michael. That's the path of my own self, whether it's aggrandizement or independence or self-sufficiency or self-confidence and I can begin to bow my knee and go, Lord Jesus, I forgive. For would you forgive me for even going this route and would you now allow me to empty myself out so that you can fill me? The idea of the Christian journey, the idea of a journey with Jesus or a Jesus journey is not that you're gonna get it perfect. The idea is actually not that you're gonna even become perfect as long as you live on planet Earth. The idea is that you actually appropriate the perfection of King Jesus through the infilling power of the Holy Spirit into your life. But what that requires is this ongoing bowing of the knee, letting go of your self, will, and way, emptying yourself so that he can fill. It, it requires such humility because it requires acknowledging that you don't have it. You hear me? Like we as Christians love to act like we've got it. In fact, not only do we have it, we're going to go tell everybody else how to do it. I'm going to tell my spouse how to do it. You hear me? I'm gonna tell my kids, and I'm, I'm not saying not to teach and not to share and not to be vulnerable, but I'm saying to the degree that you rest in your own self-confidence in your conviction that you know it and you can do it and you can make it happen and you can apply the 16 business principles that are gonna make you a huge success, you are missing it. And there is this peace and this joy and this place where the Holy Spirit can actually come in and fill you, but it requires this posture of humility, not just once, but like every single day. It's really, it's not like you're working for your salvation, but I have to work at this one to bow my knee before God and people and go, Lord Jesus, I don't have it. Would you come and empty me again? And would you fill me afresh? Like it's powerful if you can get this. <laughs> Paul and Denise say they have a place for that over there. Celebrate recovery. Thank you. Okay. Where in the world am I? All right. So we talked about um, how to be filled with the Spirit. We're talking about what keeps us from being filled with the Spirit. All right. Let's, let's now go into the third part of this, which could be the most powerful part, perhaps, if you let it. Um, but I have six things. This is not exhaustive. This is some things from the text. This is things from my relationship with the Lord. This is some things that I've read. It's kind of a mashup. Um, but six things that you can cultivate an active, ongoing relationship with the Holy Spirit. Notice I said cultivate. Does anyone farm a garden? We have a couple gardeners in the room. Like it's an ongoing thing. Like, you know, you cultivate that thing. If you have a big plot of ground, you cultivate it with a hoe, you turn it over and you, you know, maybe you mix some fertilizer in and maybe you mix some soil amendments in and maybe you mix some good fresh topsoil in there and then you turn it over again and then you come back and you plant some plants in there and then what grows next to your plants? 
Oh my goodness, the weeds grow. And when it rains, what happens to the weeds? They grow more and you have to walk out there and what do you have to do? It's the same in our hearts. It's like, uh, this is the now and not yet mystery of the kingdom of God, and I wish I could fully explain it. Are you uh, set free and fully righteous and a son or daughter in the eyes of King Jesus? Yes, if you're in him and he's in you, yes. Are you though, do you, do I have some remaining sin? And after you cultivate your garden and you step back and go, man, it's perfect, and you walk out two weeks later and go, you hear me? That's the journey. That's the journey. I'm not saying you work uh, for your salvation, but I am saying God is working in you and through you, and our job is to cultivate hearts that are receptive to him in such a way that he can make his earthly home in me. You hear me? This is not easy. It's not that you gotta go do something. No, 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 it's not easy because it requires a total surrender, which, re which requires a level of humility before God and your fellow friends and spouses and work people and everybody around you, that it is rare. Why are not more Christians full of the Spirit? Because it requires a depth and level of humility and surrender that is painful to come by. Oh, it hurts. Okay, six thoughts on cultivating an active, ongoing relationship with the Holy Spirit. Number one, I've already said it, but God will not fill what he does not have. If he does not have your heart, he can't fill it. He can't fill it. Number two, the Holy Spirit is a living person. It's a living relationship that can be cultivated or alienated. Do I need to say that again? The Holy Spirit is a living person and a living relationship that is either cultivated or alienated. Okay, let me give you an example like this. Um, this is my wife, Abby, sitting right up here. I love Abby. She's my favorite human. If I am unkind and disrespectful, which happens, ask her. It happens in your house too. The problem is you might not know it. You can park that one aside. If I am unkind or disrespectful or dismissive or whatever you want to put to it, whatever adjective you want to park there, what happens on, in the way Abby relates to me? Is she going to move towards me? Does she want to come sit next to me and, you know, put her arm around me? What does she do? She probably just, you know, Abby's not passive aggressive, so she's not going to, like, get angry. And, but she'll just kind of hang out over here until, until I figure it out. And that's a good way of saying it. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, so let's go there just a second. The Holy Spirit is a living person and a living relationship that can be cultivated or alienated. If I'm living in a way that is disrespectful, dismissive to the Holy Spirit of God, is he moving towards me or away from me? You guys gotta get this, this is so powerful. This is not about like performance and being saved. I'm not even talking about being saved. If you're in here and you don't know the Lord Jesus, it's okay. If you're online and don't know the Lord Jesus, that is a relationship where you come to him, you surrender your life. It's all about his grace. That is a supernatural transaction. But what I'm talking about now is a second work of the cross, which is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. If you live in such a way that is dismissive to the Holy Spirit of God, disrespectful to the Holy Spirit of God, elevating your own will and way over his, what's the Holy Spirit going to do? Wait. Step back and wait. Step back and wait. I'm not talking about being saved. I'm talking about the infilling, active, ongoing joy of the Lord, peace of the Lord, kindness of the Lord, presence of the Lord. And man, you can look at a marriage and go, that marriage is full of the presence of the Lord. You can look at a house and go, that house is full of the presence of the Lord. Does that mean perfect? No. We practice asking each other's forgiveness in our house an awful lot, more than I'd like. <laughs> Why? 
because we're cultivating authentic relationships with each other and with the Lord. And I'm in the business and Abby's in the business, not of raising little Pharisees that follow all the rules and get everything right, but raising authentic little humans who are self-aware and emotionally aware and enough secure in who they are and who they're not that they can look at one another and go, man, I was wrong. Would you forgive me? That's this sweet spot of surrender where the Holy Spirit comes. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, you begin to cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> okay, number one, God will not fill what he doesn't have. Number two, the Holy Spirit is a living person and a relationship that can be cultivated or alienated. Number three, when was the Holy Spirit given? I told you I'd come back to this. When was the Holy Spirit given? Come on. After what? After Jesus died. Now, Jesus' death, we've read in the last few chapters, was actually referred to as Jesus being glorified. Jesus was glorified. He was raised up on a cross, and then he was actually raised up from a grave. He was glorified. He was lifted up. And then he was actually raised up again when he ascended up into heaven. So there's three ways Jesus was glorified. The Holy Spirit is released only when King Jesus is glorified. You follow me? He will not fill the life of any person who is not wholly committed to honoring, lifting up, and glorifying King Jesus. You hear me? This isn't about perfection. I'm not saying you got to perform and, you know, oh gosh, I cussed yesterday. Okay, ask forgiveness and move on. Appropriate the, the forgiving power of Jesus and begin to ask his power to fill your life. This is like, um, this is so... Uh, this, the Holy Spirit will not fill the life of any person who is not glorifying and pointing to King Jesus. Follow me? Not perfectly, imperfectly in the broken journey. That's enough. That's enough. Number four, this is hard. I'm like working on this one personally. Make your thoughts a sanctuary. Make your mind, your will, and emotions a place where God can dwell. Number one, God will not fill what he doesn't have. Number two, the Holy Spirit is a living person and living, breathing relationship that can be cultivated or alienated. Number three, the Holy Spirit was given when Jesus was glorified, and he will not fill the life of any person who is not wholly committed to honoring and glorifying the Lord Jesus. Number four, make your thoughts a sanctuary. Let me tell you one little way that I'm doing this right now. You might think this is weird, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I, f uh, I found a couple areas in my life, amazingly, that aren't fully glorifying God. There's this, I have a dear friend, and he said to me, I, I asked him a question. I asked him for some feedback, and he said, Michael, you're not as gentle as you could be. Yeah. It, was probably, it was probably a serious understatement. So here's what I did. He was right. I knew he was right. I asked for it. He gave it. I was like, oh, Lord Jesus. So I began to search the scripture for some verses on what? Gentleness. Then I write those little verses down, and I stick them on the dashboard of my car. I have a little collection of, like, these little three-by-five cards. And guess what they all have on them? They got verses that are areas where I'm what? Weak. And I begin to live under the holy overshadowing of the word. And I begin to invite the Holy Spirit to come and renovate my own heart. When there's an area, maybe yours is anxiety. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's self-pity. Maybe it's insecurity. Maybe it's, you know, you, you fill it in. But whatever it is, you begin to search the scripture and you find that thing that would champion this area where you're weak. And in your weakness, you begin to live your life under the holy overshadowing of that scripture, appropriating the life of Jesus. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And you begin to invite the person of Jesus into your heart and life moment by moment, day by day, stoplight by stoplight when the person comes 
cut you off in traffic. You hear what I'm saying? And you're going, come on, Lord Jesus. You're beginning to actually take the word of God and you're beginning to plant it in your heart, cultivating a heart that is turned towards him, allowing him to convict you and to fill you and to change you and to renovate your heart. And then all of a sudden, what begins to happen is the supernatural presence of King Jesus can begin to work not only in your life, but in your marriage because you've invited him into your spot and into your home and in your relationships with your kids and in your al- the relationships with your alienated kids or your alienated brother or sister or with your neighbors who don't understand or people at church or people at work because what you are effectively doing in this moment is you're cultivating a heart before God that all of heaven cannot resist and the very presence of the spirit of Jesus will come and live inside of you and overflow through you to impact and to change not just your life but entire communities. That's what being a Christian is actually about. It's not about just coming to church or just singing together. It's about surrendering our lives to the point where we begin to experiencing the redemptive work of Jesus in us and through us. That's Christianity. I wanna be a part of that. These people who stand on street corners and beat other people over on the head with rules and law, I'm like, no. This is an invitational place of total surrender where you lay it down and in the laying it down, he lifts you up and you begin to co-rule and reign with him, not only for eternity. Remember last week we said, God just doesn't wanna get you into heaven. He wants to get heaven into, you want a new marriage? Start renovating your own heart. Stop pointing the finger at your spouse and go, start dealing with who? You want a new relationship at work? Start dealing with, start, you want a new relationship with your kids? Start dealing with, is it gonna be instantaneous? Is it gonna be slow? Is it gonna be arduous at points? Will it be painful to let the Holy Spirit renovate your human heart? Yes, because you are way more willful than you think you are. You may think you're compliant and oh, I'm just sweet. No, you're not, no, you're not. I guarantee it. I don't care how compliant you look. I don't care how sweet you look. I don't care how good everything looks. I guarantee inside of you is this living, breathing human who goes, I want it my way. (laughs) You know how I know that's inside of you? Because not only is it inside of me, but I've got four kids and I've never had to teach one of our kids to say mine. (laughs) Mine. It's also humbling. I've never had to teach one of our kids to lie. What do we all do? Ooh, we're gonna cover the truth. We're gonna spin it this way. Why? Because we want our will and our way. And at the end of the day, this Christian journey is actually getting to the point where you stop raising your fist against God, going my will and my way. And you begin to go, your will and your way. And as you do that, day by day, little by little, cultivation day by cultivation day, the presence of the Holy Spirit begins to take root inside of you and you can see a transformed life and the supernatural, as you step back, you will begin to see the supernatural presence of King Jesus working in and through your life. That's the gospel. Make your thoughts a sanctuary take my little note and find your little scripture and pray it at the stoplight. Live in it. Let the Holy Spirit live in you through it. Number five, cultivate the art of recognizing the presence of the Holy Spirit daily, moment by moment. I don't know how to do this, just being truthful. My brain gets tugged in like a hundred different ways before eight o'clock every morning. And yours does too, right? But here's what I'm learning to do, to step back, to call a time out, and to go, Lord, where are you? What's happening? How can I participate with you in establishing your rule and reign and welcoming your kingdom into this place, into the now, and not establishing my will and my way, my rule and my reign. And in that moment by moment, sort of daily cultivating and recognizing the presence of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I'm, I'm seeing inside myself. In order to recognize the Holy Spirit moment by moment, day by day, I'm having to slow down. I run really hard. My brain pushes hard. I run a business. We're running a growing church. I'm always like. And if I don't throttle back, I'm finding that I am missing 
the Holy Spirit of God in my life. And if I can just consciously throttle back for a few minutes here and a few minutes there and different points throughout the day, I am finding that the kingdom of God is more powerfully working both in me and through me. Number six, sit in the word and let the Holy Spirit of God come and brood over you as you brood over his word. It's why I call us as a church to be in the one-year Bible. Get up every morning and expect that your father your Abba, your Father God that loves you and is so much more kind and gracious and gentle than you think he is, has something to say to you in and through his word. And open that up with a hungry expectation that he might encounter you. The six things again, God won't fill what he doesn't have. The Holy Spirit is a living person in relationship that can be cultivated or alienated. The Holy Spirit was given when Jesus was glorified. And he will not fill the life of any person whose life is not wholly committed to honoring and glorifying King Jesus. Number four, make your thoughts a sanctuary. Number five, cultivate the art of recognizing the presence of the Holy Spirit daily, moment by moment. And number six, sit in the word and let the Holy Spirit of God come and brood over your mind, will, and emotions as you brood over his word. That's an Old Testament word, hovered over the waters is what that means. Here's what I'd love for us to do. As Adam plays and we sing a closing song, I'd love, just a minute, you don't have to move yet, but I'm gonna invite you to stand in just a second. If you wanna come forward, there's a nice big place up here, you can come forward. Um, I'm going to have our prayer team come up. You can go ahead and come up, prayer team, if you want. But what's more important, I think, in this moment and on this particular Sunday than going to a particular prayer person, which please do, if you have a specific need, come to a prayer person. But I think what's more important is that we as a people actually begin to go, Lord Jesus, I want to cultivate a heart that is receptive to you. Lord Jesus, I believe that you've gone to make a heavenly mansion for me. Now would you make me an earthly mansion for you? And whatever that next step is for you, I want to invite you to take it. You can come forward, you can stand in your seat, you can close your eyes, you can lift your hands. But here's what God recognizes is the posture of a humble, hungry heart that is surrendered to him. And when you come before King Jesus with a humble, hungry heart that is surrendered to him, he will never send you away. Let's stand. church, this is an intensely personal moment. Come forward if you'd like. Fill the space up here if you want. Take a step from your chair. I'd encourage you though, do something you've never done before. Change something up. Move around. Hold a hand up. Close an eye. Shift the entire conversation as an outward symbol of what's going on inside of you. Make sense? Let's take a step and let's trust that the Lord Jesus will meet us and fill us more powerfully in it. Let's worship the Lord together. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship.
Have your way Have your way In me Have your way Come and have your way In me Have your Jesus a long time. As you exit today, here's what I want you to keep in mind. Go back to the burrito wrap. <laughs> it's in the emptying that you are now available to be. Say it again. It's in the emptying that you are now available to be filled. Keep that posture. Keep that humility. Keep that openness and begin to practice the presence of this most Holy Spirit as you send us out of this church on this day, Father, would you make yourself more real to us? Would you fill us more fully? Would you make us brave, courageous? Father, would you go before us and would you come behind us? In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We love you guys. We believe in what Jesus is doing here in us and through us. There's a Next Steps meeting, Saltbox Connect meeting in the cafeteria if you want to join us. If you've never given your life to Jesus, we'd love to pray with you. Go practicing the presence of the Lord Jesus. 